Hey guys, so this is on the Haas Brothers, who are furniture designers and artists based in LA. They've created a whimsical and alluring world within their work that merges art, fashion, film, music, and design. They're proficient in a multitude of mediums and have found a way to combine the materials of the now with old artistic practices. Their work conveys humor and emotion through gesture and expression, and their work is visually entertaining both through content as well as their use of materiality. They're proficient in a wide range of mediums from bronze, craft beads, porcelain, oil paint, fabric, wood. It's just a lot, okay? Their work provides a bridge between the high fine arts and regular people, and their social media usage shows their artistic methods and engages the public. They exist in a space outside the design world and outside the contemporary art world, yet they've Frankensteined both together to become one of many hybrid artists that are blending the lines between artistic disciplines. The transdisciplinary nature of the Haas Brothers' work blurs the lines between fine art and decor, elitism and consumerism, paving the way for a new, more accessible kind of artist. Okay, so let's do some biography. So the Haas Brothers are twins, Nikolai and Simon, and they were born in Santa Monica in 1984. And they come from, like, a very successful and artistic family. Their older brother, Lucas, was an actor. Their mother, Emily, was an opera singer, um, which inspired Nikolai to get into music. Um, their father, Ber Berthard ha Haas, is a sculptor and furniture designer, which served more as an inspiration for Simon. Um, and it was from their father's business, which designed custom fireplaces, countertops, fountain, grottos, and public installations that the brothers learned to work in limestone, steel, bronze, wood, glass, and a lot of the materials that they still use now in their artistic practice. So, Berthard's work was highly collaborative, which taught the brothers the value of having a creative team throughout the artistic process. There's vibrant colors that are very gestural and cartoon-like, um, which was a clear source of inspiration for Nikolai and Simon. The twins parted ways in 2003 to pursue individual artistic goals. In their early 20s, um, they separated to pursue music and art, with Simon studying painting and furniture design at RISD while Nikolai toured with his band. And their separate experiences in their early 20s taught them how to succeed both in the fine arts and the real world, where like touring as a musician taught practical lessons relating to business, networking, and branding, whereas Simon's experience at RISD provided a connection to an understanding of the fine arts world. All right, so 2010, the Haas brothers moved to LA um, and they started a little cabinet business. And they were also closer to their brother Lucas, who, if you remember, was an actor. But he wasn't just any actor. He was friends with Leonardo DiCaprio because apparently in, like, the 90s, there was this thing called the Pussy Posse. <laughs> Stupid. Um, and it was, like, Leonardo's friends, and they just were, like, clubbing, you know, going after it. And then the tabloids called them that. So, obviously, if your brother is a part of the Pussy Posse, you should take full advantage of that connection. And the Haas brothers did. So their first client ever was Toby Maguire, who hired them to design a cabinet for his home. And with the success that Toby Maguire's business produced, the brothers took out a three-year lease on a studio in LA, where they were financially backed by, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio. Because of their connections to Hollywood, the Haas brothers' breadth of influence in their early years was pretty much confined to celebrities. In 2013, their first major collaboration was with Versace Home, and working with a major fashion house leader led to more celebrity clients like Lady Gaga and Rihanna. Um, and since then, the brothers have been featured in W Magazine, Vanity Fair, and Vogue Italia. Because of their connections, it's safe to say that the brothers achieved in a matter of like three years what most artists spend an entire lifetime striving for. So most artists will try to get into elite circles by receiving critical attention, getting into good craft fairs, or you know, getting into elite galleries. But the Haas brothers took the opposite approach, where they already had the celebrity clientele which then get, got them critical attention and got them into the more prestigious galleries and fairs. So the Haas brothers were widely considered to be within the design world until they achieved this like artistic excellence within the ceramic sphere of the fine arts world through their accretion series. Being a furniture designer is all about blending the line between design and art. It's all about holding expression over concept and it's all about being as free as possible and as exploratory as possible with no regret and no limitation to where you can take it. The first step in making this design is inspiration. 
uh, we drew a lot of sketches, um, talked to our head ceramicist, and then put down a form. Um, at that point, uh, we work with him to coil build uh, the initial form. The coiling process is a process where you take cords of clay and then you blend those cords together to create a solid wall or a body. So it really allows you to do just about any shape you could possibly want. The accretion process is a process that we developed after looking at tree fungus and we were also looking at corals and how they build themselves. We mimic a very natural sedimentary build-up process. We have an idea and we're going to make it happen and the natural process assists you in that. And there's inherent beauty. If you read it and you're still sensitive to it, you can take it to a place that's beyond what it would do on its own. We spray the glaze usually when we want to achieve a very even application. So just like we spend years researching one color, firing it, adding slightly different minerals, we'll also do lots of texture tests. We use a gold luster. It's 24 karat gold suspended in a mix of herbs. It's like an ancient Egyptian recipe been chasing these very difficult to find colors, especially pink. Pink is a very rare color in nature. Pink is relatable to sex. It's relatable to femininity. It's relatable to a lot of different things. The very last step in the process is tooling a brass plate for the bottom and feet. Most of what we do, we weren't professional at when we started doing it. Um, and that's really important for us that all of our forms, all of our shapes come from a place of not bowing down to the material, but making material bow down to our fantasy. The accretion series mean for ceramics. Now, just for some context, ceramics is one of the oldest human inventions and art forms, and it's been like around since before the Neolithic period, with objects dating as far back as like 29,000 BC. So like pottery is really old and when you develop a new method for it that's equally as rare as it is historic. So like those who stumble upon a new technique automatically gain critical attention from the art world. The House Brothers accretion technique is like the ceramic equivalent to Gerard Richter's squeegee paintings where like both ceramics and paintings have a very rich history that's taught to students in art schools. Like for ceramics, the ancient techniques of wabi-sabi or Chinese porcelain are just as influential to the modern ceramicist as the figures of Michelangelo and Raphael are to modern painters. Students are taught the old methods to master a medium, but it's the rare artist who invents something new who establishes himself within that medium as a master of his own technique. So given all that, the celebrity clientele of the brothers, in combination with their little accretions, there's really nothing left for them but to go to Art Basel, Miami. So after they got into the fair, that was sort of, you know, that's one of the many peaks of an artist's career. And they focused the second half of their career after reaching that sort of peak as a way to give back to the community, which they did in their next series, which is A Freaks, which strays from ceramics into sculpture. While on a trip to Africa, the Haas brothers saw a group of women beading and sat with them to learn the South African beading techniques. Their book, Haas Brothers Volume 2, explains what this process was like through small stories and poems. When incorporating artistic techniques from other cultures in your own art, it's easy and all too common to appropriate, take credit for, and rip off indigenous people. The Haas brothers intentionally avoided this pitfall and worked in true collaboration with these women. Their book lists these women as artists alongside the brothers and calls them the Haas sisters. The A Freaks show provided financial support to these women and created engagement with other cultures instead of appropriating African beadwork. Mm -hmm. Then they took the idea home to Lost Hills, California. I've known Nikki and Simon for years and owned some of their extraordinary, imaginative pieces. Uh, we're the Haas brothers. I'm Simon. I'm Nikki. I'd say that uh, I'm the sculptor and the humorist in the relationship, and Simon would be the inventor and the uh, obsessive philosopher in the relationship. Well, Simon and I will do drawings together and we'll come up with a plant that we want to make. Simon will break that plant down into sections that would be like sort of, this is a leaf, this is a branch. And then he'll go, what program can I create that can build that shape? 
Simon couldn't find anyone to do the intricate beading that he wanted in this project. And I said, I have girls for you. Linda suggested doing it in Lost Hills. There were a lot of women who needed the work there, and they're all good with their hands. So take the end that you don't want to have visible and just put it through a couple of beads so that it disappears. Teaching this beading method is difficult because it is not a, a sort of standard flat beadwork. It's a three-dimensional form uh, that is based on abstract logic. Y gracias pues a las hermanojas, si ese trabajo no hubiera existido, no sé dónde estaría ahorita. Um, le di una sorpresa a mi esposo, pagué el carro. It's brought me this sense of belonging in society, not being a burden to it. The A Freaks show is an example of the philanthropic trajectory that the Haas brothers have been on throughout their later work. Since they achieved success so early on, they used their influence to empower the underprivileged and make fine art more accessible to the public. This accessibility breaks down to who can make their art, who can buy their art, and who can understand their art. Part of the vision of our practice and what we see as essential to the creation of art is the establishment of communities. We are constantly asking how we can engage with others to achieve something new, something beautiful, something that excites or brings joy. That is the real importance and value of art and art making. The Haas brothers want their work to be unifying and the process to be community building. Their artwork does not need to be made by them in order for it to be a part of their vision. The Haas sisters are permanent employees of Nikolai and Simon, where they're creating the newest beading called Micro Freaks. They're like collectible sculptures, basically. So we keep these 20 women employed year after year. The Haas brothers' work centers around transparency of their artistic processes. Simon has explained the methods that he's used to make his micro freaks in several books, which is a free way for anybody to make their own Haas brothers' work. They've also been transparent with their accretion technique and have posted videos explaining how to make it on your own pots. For anybody with access to clay or beads, the brothers have made it very possible to replicate their work, and they encourage people to make their own as a way to buy into their vision and aesthetic. The prices of their work range from free to over $50,000. Since they were furniture designers first, the brothers have an interest in functional art for the everyday person. They've created decor that's available for free on their website. They sell work in Neiman Marcus, Bloomingdale's, Saks Fifth Avenue, and most expensive, Art Basel Miami. On the website, you can buy a micro freak for like $1,000, or you can make your own for free. You can d buy designed playing cards, shirts, or download free children's books. There's a clear range in prices because the value is creating community above all else. The Huss Brothers' work is conceptually accessible to all. They don't try to over-intellectualize their art or only appeal to a certain demographic. I value them for their materiality and I think they're good entry-level artists for those outside the art world, which is their goal. They try to be accessible to the everyday person. Nikolai explained the ideology behind their work. If you make it cute, people relate to the cuteness, so cuteness serves as a function. We're programmed to see faces and try to empathize with objects. Our brains want to find a face and relate it to an object, so you don't have to put very much there. If you include a pun or a joke, whoever's looking at it has an immediate connection. They don't have to like it, but they do have to feel connected to it. They intentionally include references into their work so that common people can understand, so that they feel involved like they know what the work is about. Aesthetically, they also have a very abstract, cartoon-like appearance which children can appreciate, but at times include deeper sexual themes for a more mature audience. Both children and prestigious art critics can appreciate their work. The Haas brothers' contribution to contemporary art is a relocation of where the art takes place. Their work is able to create a world within itself without having to overdo displays or use projections or graphics. The physical presence of their work alone creates an immersive experience for their audience. They're at the forefront of combining old techniques with the materials available to us in the 21st century. Their work blends the lines between fine art and decor in that they found a balance between sculptural excellence and decorative functionality. They've also found a balance between elitism and consumerism. They don't consider the value of their work dependent on its inaccessibility. They share their methods, they encourage people to make art in their style, and they have work that's available for purchase at every price range. They want people to buy into their vision. As Nikolai said, We've created a culture, and I think that's cooler than creating an aesthetic.